Welcome everyone. I'm Penny Lewis, Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, using biological products to fight diseases and pests. This presentation is part of the Focus on Sustainability webinar series, a series developed by a group of organizations known for their quality ecological education. By collaborating on these webinars, we expand the reach of our regional programs to a nationwide audience. In case you're not familiar with our organizations, they're all nonprofit and largely volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, and Ecolandscape California. If you have a question for the presenter, you may ask it by typing in the question box at any time during the broadcast, and we'll be addressing all questions at the end of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Joe Magazzi. Joe's the president and co-founder of Green Earth Agriculture, providing eco-friendly products and consulting services to land care professionals and farmers. With degrees in genetics and microbiology, Joe has been involved in the research and development of microbial based products for use in turf care and agriculture for many years. His research has been published in many magazines and scientific journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine. Welcome, Joe. Thanks, Penny, and thanks for everybody for tuning in. It's great to have um, a reach across the country with a bunch of different great organizations. And um, a lot of you are, are thinking about sustainability and better environment and leaving a better planet for our children and our grandchildren. Um, and that's one of the big considerations of this talk is how to go greener, how to go more organic. Um, the other consideration is a lot of states now have um, pesticide bans in place or fertilizer bans. So every day tools are being taken out of your belt. And a lot of what we don't think about is how do we replenish these tools? Well, what we're gonna to cover today is not just meeting your customers' demands for more greener and organic programs, um, and also um, everybody's goal for sustainability and greener, but also how you can use biologicals, um, which a lot of people don't think of, but actually tools to help um, uh, fit with these laws and help you comply with fertilizer laws and pesticide bans, which is a big thing right now. So I, I broke the part, uh, the talk into three different parts. Um, we're going to talk about biologicals for everyday treatment to help reduce fertilizer and water use, which um, is a very important thing and really the number one thing people use biologicals for um, and, and um, where we've seen a lot of changes in the field. Um, even though it doesn't have to do with the title, Enemy, Enemy is My Friend, um, plant health is part of um, reducing disease and pests. And then we're going to talk about biologicals for disease control. This would be for preventing um, fungal and bacterial infections um, and pathogens. And then we have um, biologicals for pest control. So general pest control for a whole host of pest insects. And then specifically for grub um, and beetle control because um, I, we used to always say when we started our company about eight years ago that um, there were two holy grails in organic and that was really organic weed control as well as organic grub control. And um, the grub control is I think the most exciting change I've seen in the last year or two. And um, so I'm gonna focus on that as a separate section, but um, some really great changes. Um, and what biologicals really are and what we're gonna see is um, five years ago, 10 years ago when we started, we used to say that uh, biologicals or organics in general are really a compromise and you're compromising your programs. And that's no longer the case. Um, in the last few years with, um, I hate to use the word technology, but the technology that's come along in the organic fields, um, with biologicals now, not only are they more efficacious and working better, but they're very specific. And, and you really have silver bullets now to treat the pest and not the rest, um, as one of our, of our um, partners says. And you're really going after just what you want to go after, as opposed to putting down a chemical, um, organic or not, that will kill everything. So really exciting changes in the field. And um, I'm really excited about talking about this today. Um, so the first thing is really um, using probiotics as a tool is just the relationships of plants, trees, and turf with microorganisms. Um, 
this is really, this field has exploded in the last um, five years and three years. Um, I subscribe to something called Science Daily. Um, any of you um, out there that are geeks and nerds like um, like I am, um, Science Daily is a wonderful website. You sign up for it and um, you can put in your interests. Um, it's all free. And every morning they, they give you a list of um, new advances in the scientific field that come out. And um, I've been subscribing to this for 20, 15 years now probably. Um, in my previous life, um, developing flu inhibitors um, and pain drugs. Um, I used to do that. Now I change over to plant stuff. And the biggest change I've seen in the field is all the microbiology and all the biologicals that are coming out and what has really happened. And this is just a screenshot. I'm not going to go into detail here, but bacteria enhance growth of fruit trees up to 40%. Um, a tremendous amount of research. Um, it's really come into its own and, and the science is really catching up with the observations uh, many organic people have made for, for many years. And it's just, uh, it's an exciting time to be in the field and work with biologicals. And there's a lot of changes happening and uh, our heads are spinning sometimes just to try to keep up with it. Um, so now I always like to start with this, this slide, um, what is soil? How do we supplement it? And um, we all know what soil is, but this is not so much, um, not meant to insult anybody, but just to get you thinking a little bit differently about how we treat our plants, our, our turf, our trees, um, how we do our landscaping. Um, so we know there's the mineral, the mineral and the nutrient component of soil. Um, we know that there's the water component of soil, there's a gas component, and there's the organic matter and the microbe component. Um, we all add fertilizers and, and nutrients. Um, Mother Nature waters, or we water when necessary. Um, gases come in through processes like aeration, um, dethatching, um, or just um, from contact with the air, um, or come in through the water. What had people done typically to, to address um, not just the organic matter, but the microbial component of soil, which is completely vital? Um, common practices largely ignored supplementing this. And not only did they ignore it, but many of the chemicals that were used in traditional lawn care, traditional agriculture, are actually detrimental to the microbes. So um, you're really not only not supplementing microbes um, as we try to push growth quicker and quicker, but um, you're actually practices that decrease the microbes and cause the need for, for more nutrients and more, more, um, more pesticide use. So um, Jamie Lee Curtis, we've seen, um, I always call her my best salesman and I've never uh, uh, paid her a cent, but um, we've all seen um, um, you know, commercials for yogurts. A lot of people take probiotics now. There's really been an explosion also in human medicine. And we all know what probiotics can do for human health and human digestion. And, and they're actually using probiotics now to cure diseases. Um, things like inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, um, depression. It's, it's pretty amazing what's going on. So we all know um, what probiotics in, are for human health and digestion. Um, when you think about the human or an animal digestive system, we have mechanical digestion. We have intestines. Our stomach has a pH of two, which will break down a lot of different proteins and, and things that we eat. And we have beneficial microbes. That's when we supplement with the probiotics. If you think about a plant having a stomach too, it's the soil. Um, that's their digestive system. That's how they get all the nutrients. Um, a plant does not have a mechanical digestion system. A plant does not have an acidic pH of two. What they do have is the beneficial microbes. So if you understand how important um, beneficial microbes are for human digestion, then you can get, it's even more vital for plant health and, and not digestion, but nutrient uptake. It's, it's really amazing. Um, so if you think about what we're talking about today is kind of yogurt for plants, um, I think it helps you really understand how um, vital and important these these microbes are for for the, the health of your landscape and your turf and your your trees. Um, some cool facts, just real quick about microorganisms. One gram of soil contains a million fungi and a billion bacteria, so about a spoonful, maybe a little bit more. Um, there's a tremendous amount of biology in there. Nature tends not to do things um, it doesn't need, um, and we're just really scratching the surface on why all these microbes are in the soil. Um, just to give you a perspective, 
um, in one acre of soil, just a thin layer of soil, there's one ton of bacteria. That, that would be two cows uh, worth of bacteria in the soil. So it's a tremendous amount of biomatter. Um, this, I haven't updated the slide in a while, um, but um, I need to do some research. But um, the initial estimates several years ago were four to 10,000 species of bacteria in a gram of soil. It's a lot more than that. Every day there's more and more. And if we found 0.005% of those, those species, um, I would be surprised at this point. And we don't even know what a lot of them are doing. Um, and just to put it in perspective as well, 90 to 95% of the cells on or in the human body are bacteria. That means only one out of every 10 cells on our body is our own and the rest are bacteria. So bacteria are vital for not just our existence, but uh, for plants, trees, and turf. Um, many of you have seen the soil food web. Um, this was made famous um, by Elaine Ingham, who did a tremendous amount in the field. Um, and it really just shows um, she broke it down or it's been broken down into trophic levels. Um, first trophic level being the sunlight and a plant um, and plants actually feed the microbes in the soil. Um, they'll give up al almost half of their energy to feed the plants. Um, that would be first trophic level. And then there's, um, there's actually photosynthetic bacteria in the soil. Um, in the sea, there's phytoplankton. They're, they're the photosynthetic unit that provide the energy for the whole system. What we're really focusing on today is, is this first trophic level here. Um, I'm going to focus on the bacteria, fungi, and nematodes. Um, there's a lot going on with, you'll hear IPM and um, using biologicals such as ladybugs and parasitic wasps. Um, we're just not going to get at that level for the sake of time, um, but there's a lot of good information out there. Um, we're going to focus more on what we can do with these uh, for second trophic level or beneficial bacteria, fungi, and nematodes. Um, I don't want to turn this into a microbiology lesson, but um, what we're going to be talking about are fungi and bacteria. Bacteria tend to be smaller and more dynamic. Um, they have um, a lot more versatility in the soil. Also, bacteria are what are called prokaryotic um, um, cell types. Uh, fungi are actually eukaryotic, which is the same as us. So fungi is actually more related to a human cell than a bacterial cell, but they're both vital in the soil. So, um, so this is really, that's the introduction to biologicals. Um, the first section is really going to focus on fertilizer reduction and water reduction using um, beneficial microbes as soil inoculants. Um, many states, um, I know we have people throughout the country, um, here in the Northeast, I'm just showing some screenshots from New Jersey, New York, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Um, there's a lot of bans now on fertilizers in this part of the country. I know around the Great Lakes there's a lot. Um, California, I think there's some coming on board. Um, if they haven't come on board yet, they probably will um, at some point for you. Um, so there's a lot of, um, this is where we talked initially about taking tools out of your belt. There's a lot of bans right now on using um, phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizers um, because of the bad things. Um, last time I checked, there were at least 11 states, I think that's a much higher now, that have some sort of fertilizer ban or restriction. So what we're talking about is putting tools back in your belt when you can't use phosphorus, when you can't use nitrogen, um, you want better growth and you're not getting the results you need. Or when you are using those and you're not seeing what you should be seeing. A lot of times that disconnect is the biology. And what we're really talking about here is connecting the chemistry, which we're all familiar with as far as doing soil testing, which is vital part of, of any um, good program, whether you're a farmer or landscaper um, or horticulturist, and connecting the, the chemistry with the biology. Um, Many of you, you guys are obviously in, in ecological organizations. Um, we don't, you know, I, I don't need to preach to the choir about the, the ill effects of fertilizer. Um, fertilizers, what I do want to tell you is fertilizers um, and pesticides um, are harmful, obviously, but both synthetic and, and organic. That fish that died up in the upper left of eutrophication, um, he wasn't asking if it was an omri listed fertilizer that killed him. Um, so we need to really practice, and I always try to stress this um, with organic growers, um, organic doesn't always mean safe. And I like to say, let's apply IPM principles even to our organic programs. That means doing a soil test and adding your nitrogen and your phosphorus and your other micros as needed. Um, in this part of the country, most soil tests I've seen were off the charts in phosphorus, and people still add phosphorus, even organic um, growers and, and landscapers. So 
um, it's vital to still minimize whether they're using organic or synthetic fertilizers. Um, and nitrogen production makes up about three, four percent of the world's energy. So um, um, not not including the environmental damage. So fertilizer reduction is is a major thing for for many many reasons. Not only that, but um, too much nitrogen and phosphorus can actually be harmful. Um, can be harmful to plants, lead to unhealthy growth, burning, like the picture on the right. Um, artificially fast growth, um, things grow and they're unhealthy. We're going to talk about that in the disease and pest section. But um, you don't get healthy growth. You you get um, it looks good um, and then things crash and die. Um, high phosphorus is actually toxic to beneficial mi microbes. Um, nitrogen and, and phosphorus um, become like a cesspool in the, in the soil and can instigate pest and disease control. So this all kind of comes back together. Um, and and plants that are grown in a healthy matter with biologicals and, and balanced chemistry, really, um, you see a lot less damage from pathogens and, and insects. Um, the main thing, um, and this is a little off topic, but the main thing microbes do really is are cycling carbon and breaking down organic molecules in the soil. So how many times have you drove by a compost pile in the winter and it's steaming and you stick your hand in it, it's about 90 degrees in the middle? That's all microbial activity. Um, that's the primary thing. If, if you had a sterile compost pile and you came back in three weeks, you'd still have a pile of leaves and twigs and banana peels. Um, when it used to be um, when I first started in the field, people with thatch, um, they were told, oh, stop um, recycling your clippings. Uh, if you had compaction, aerate, and um, that's not true. If you have thatch, there's a breakdown in the biological matter. Thatch should be broken down. I can't tell you how many of our, our clients and people have called us with thatch and we've given them a bottle of beneficial bacteria or fungi and their thatch has gone within weeks and they've never had a problem again. So um, that's the primary thing of what microbes are doing. We've also used microbes. Um, we had the hurricanes here in the Northeast. We used microbes to help mediate uh, the high salt damage. Um, we've uh, mediated soil, um, excuse me, oil spills from very large uh, um, chemical companies, um, heavy metal toxicity in soils, um, wonderful things for many different um, things, not just uh, breaking down organic matter, helping with composting, helping with compaction or thatch, but also detoxifying soil. Um, the main thing we want to talk about for the sake of this is really um, using probiotics as a nutrient and retention and delivery system. That's their primary function. And using microbials properly with a good balanced um, um, fertilizer and nutrient program, um, it's amazing what you'll see in the reduction of fertilizer, whether it's organic or synthetic. Um, retention, beneficial organisms fix nutrients into their cell bodies. They're sticky if you think about it that way, and they help to keep the, the nutrients in the soil. So microbes grow to their environment. So the more these nutrients you add, the more the microbes grow and take care of that. Um, the other thing is delivery. Um, I'm going to show you a movie here because I always say pictures worth a thousand words, but the microbes are actually traveling through the plant and through the soil and delivering those microbes. And one of the neatest things I think, um, I came from the human side of medicine. I used to look at plants and trees and turf as very simple organisms and boy was I wrong. Um, and I used to, was one of those people that said soil was dirt and soil is a living organism as far as I'm concerned. But the neatest thing is, when trees are, are um, deficient in nutrients, they actually farm bacteria, just like we farm animals or, or farm plants. And they'll actually recruit nutrients through their root exudates that they put out, and they can pick and choose what microbes. So if they need phosphorus, they will recruit microbes that can solubilize phosphorus. It's, it's amazing, the feedback. And we're just really starting to understand this. And um, um, I'd be lying to you if I said I, I get this completely or anybody knows how this works. It's just a really neat thing. Um, and I think it's pretty amazing. Um, this is just, again, um, I could say anything to you guys, but these are just fact sheets from the Ohio State. There's a lot of publications, but a diverse microbial population with fungus and organisms keep nutrients recycling and disease organisms in check. And that's really the whole key. Um, two main things I want to touch upon about 
the really beneficial part of microbes in the soil and how they help you reduce nitrogen. Um, nitrogen, our, our air is um, full of nitrogen, um, about 70% nitrogen. And uh, um, yet we're throwing down all this nitrogen fertilizer. So there's a big disconnect. When you add fertilizers or nitrogen, um, whether it's organic like manures um, or compost from decomposed plants, um, that goes into the soil as what's called um, ammonia, essentially. Ammonia or urea is higher level nitrogen. When you look at an assimilation, in other words, what a plant needs to take up, um, it's not ammonia, it's nitrates. So we add our fertilizers, whether it's naturally or we add them um, in the form of ammonia. Very little of this can be taken up by the plants. Ammonia needs to be cycled to nitrates or excuse me, nitrites and then nitrates in order for a plant to optimize the nitrogen. Um, well, guess who's doing that? In the soil, there's something called nitrifying bacteria. And these bacteria control the cycle. So when you add the right microbes to the soil, your fertilizers go through the cycle quicker and that makes the nitrogen much more efficient. So it's not about adding more nitrogen, it's about making that nitrogen more efficient. Not only that, but there's nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, a lot of people talk about this um, more in terms of agriculture. Um, we know legumes, peas, um, things like that um, have nodules. They actually farm the microbes on their root system and give an environment that they could fix nitrogen. Um, and that's why they're so high in proteins and other nitrogen compounds because the nitrogen out of the air is fixed. Well, this is actually happening in the soil also outside the plant. So you're actually taking nitrogen with a good microbial mix out of the air and you're adding it and cycling it quicker. And this makes a tremendous amount of difference in nitrogen. I've had um, um, clients and I've heard stories of people using microbials that are able to reduce nitrogen 50%, 75%. Some can even get away without it. It depends on your situation. The other really neat thing, um, I talked about phosphate levels here in New England. Um, our phosphate's off the chart, um, but I can't tell you how many times I've seen a soil test where there's been tremendous amount of phosphates in the soil, and yet if you do a tissue test, a plant is starving for phosphate. And then I've seen the opposite where there's soils where there's very little phosphorus. They say plant can't grow here, yet you take a tissue sample and the tissue is actually in a good phosphate range. The difference, again, the disconnect between the phosphate in the soil and the phosphate in the plant is your microbes. So there's actually phosphate solubilizing microbes in the soil, things like Pseudomonas um, and certain um, other strains of Bacillus. Um, a lot of bacteria that are commonly and, and fungi that are commonly found in, in, in standard soil inoculants. Um, this is absolutely vital. Um, you can essentially put microbes down if you had a phosphorus band and get a phosphorus value from what the microbes can solubilize and take out of the soil. Um, think about the phosphate almost being in rock forms and these guys are, are taking it and solubilizing it along with the nitrogen and cycling it and your phosphorus and your nitrogen and, and just your nutrient values in general become so much efficient. So it's better for the environment. Um, helps you comply with laws, um, and also saves you and your customers a lot of money. Uh, phosphorus is not going down in costs. So just to put this in perspective, um, we've got our good lawn with good biology, if you inoculated it, and the, the poor biology soil, a tale of two soils, I like to call it. So we come in, we do our fertilizer test, um, we add our fertilizers, NPKs. I hope a lot of you are also adding micronutrients. Um, when we add these nutrients, as I said, the microbes grow to their environment. So the more nutrients in the soil, more microbes you get. And they take all these nutrients up into their, their cell bodies. Um, if you have poor soil biology, it's just kind of sitting there in the soil profile. And then what happens? Um, here in New England, um, if it's the spring, we've got probably three straight months of rain here. Um, and Or you irrigate. And what happens is uh, with good biology, that that Nutri those nutrients are cycling quicker. Um, they're sticking around longer. They're not being washed out as quickly with, with the rain and the water, um, and you're getting a better value. And then what happens? Again, here in New England, after the three months of rain, it stops one day, and then we've got three months of drought, and you have no water, um, no movement. And those microbes will start to die off a little bit. And as they die off, they release all these nutrients. And it's it's like a giant buffering system in your soil. So. I always like to say a picture is worth a thousand words. 
And um, I'm going to show you this video here. What we're looking at here is a root hair um, before I start it. Um, and these little moving things are the microbes. I always, it always amazes me when I pull a plant out of the ground, you look at the root structure and there's really not that much surface area. And it amazes me how, how can a plant grow so big with not what you'd expect for a surface area of roots? Well, again, the, the disconnect is the biologicals. Watch this video and I'm gonna fast forward to the second part, but watch this video and watch the microbes coming in and out of the root hairs. And what they're doing is they're actually taking the sugars that that plant is putting out to feed them. And in return, they're bringing the phosphorus and the nitrogen, those other nutrients. It's really amazing when you, when you see it. Let's play this here for you. You see these microbes coming in and out. So it works not just with nutrients, but with water as well, as, as they said in the video. Um, these microbes are delivering and really working in conjunction in a mutualistic way with the plant. And it's really an amazing relationship. A um, lot of research um, coming out. These are just some university studies showing root length increase, um, which is one of the, the major things you see with beneficial microbes. Um, this is, um, we work with a lot of um, professional sports fields. Um, we work with Disney, we work with a lot of people. Um, they may or may not be interested in organics, um, but this just shows you, um, this is Raymond James Stadium where the Tampa Bay, excuse me, I'm having some issues here, um, where the Tampa Bay Bucks play um, a couple of weeks. This is about two weeks before a game. They're adding fertilizer probably 10 different ways. They simply inoculated and all that fertilizer value got released. That's actually one week after. It's amazing um, what the biologicals can do. All the nutrients were sitting there. They were just dormant. And then they were at, the microbes were added and everything just exploded. And uh, uh, the Tampa Bay Bucks got to play in a nice field. Um, this is here in Connecticut. Um, this was done by Steve Bousquet at American Landscape, who's been doing organics for many, many years. Um, this was a trial field he did right out in front when we first started working with him. Um, this side was a mixture of beneficial bacteria, what I like to call prebiotics, um, just a simple mixture of fish, seaweed, humates, um, some yucca extract. And over here, he did a typical synthetic where he was using nitrogen-based um, fertilizers and he was using polymers for water retention. Um, Steve, when I saw this, he, he pulled me over. It was pretty amazing. Um, um, he was telling me not only did this look better and um, he was cutting it more often. I mean, obviously the differences are striking, but he also pointed out to me this side was getting irrigation. As you can see the irrigation over here, this side didn't. And this was, I believe, August two years ago. We're in the middle of a drought. Um, it's pretty amazing what the microbes can do. And I'll show you later what those root systems look like, which is the key here. Um, plants, a lot of uh, a lot of people in this audience are doing um, ornamental installs. Um, same thing, differences just adding beneficial microbes to very rich soil. Um, trees, uh, same thing. You can see the difference in growth with these pines. Um, across the spectrum, if it grows in water, and even for those of you that are doing aquaponics and hydroponics, um, the microbes are the key to really making things better. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next section here. Um, my apologies if I'm talking quickly, but um, there's a lot to cover and I'm certainly able to take questions afterwards um, and I can stay on late if needed and then I'll give you my contact information. And um, I believe I'll be able to upload this, uh, um, not only the presentation, but um, I know the ELA is recording this. So um, we're, we're talking about seed germination, root growth, transplant survival. Um, one of the coolest, one of the other coolest things is Beneficial microbes actually produce plant hormones. Um, you know, when you think about the three big um, hormone um, families, the gibberellic acids, um, your gibberellins, your auxins, your cytokinins, um, a lot of the bacteria commonly associated with inoculants actually produce these 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 uh, hormones. And again, when I switched from the human side of medicine, I said, why would a bacteria produce plant hormones? And um, somebody explained it to me really well, and they said, well. Think about an acorn. A pathogen looks at an acorn and says, sees a great source of 
protein and fats. And a pathogen will eat that acorn and then there's no food and the pathogen dies or goes dormant. A beneficial will look at that acorn and say, wow, this is a tree that's gonna feed me for 100, 200, maybe 300 years. Um, so it's in that microbes, that beneficial microbes interest to have that acorn or whatever seed you're using um, grow as quickly as possible and start producing photosynthesis. So the microbes will actually produce hormones and, and we can exploit this. Um, a big thing now is actually seed coating or when you, um, a lot of people that are, are, are doing um, grass seed, whether it's um, slice seeding um, or other methods, um, we'll actually put beneficials down at the point instead of fertilizers, because fertilizers is growing um, kind of artificially. The microbes will produce the hormone and help with the, the um, quicker growth. And not only that, but it works the other way too. As I said before, the plants can signal the microbes they need. Um, so this is just, again, a scientific paper. I'm not gonna get into it, but um, basically a significant promotion of germination and seedling development with inoculation of beneficial bacteria and fungi. And that's in orchids. If you, if you can speed up orchid growth, then you're doing something right. It's one of the most difficult things to grow. Um, not only beneficial bacteria, but um, a lot of you may use um, trichoderma is a big thing in seed inoculations. Um, a lot of people I know use a product called Root Shield, um, which is trichoderma. Um, this just shows um, the difference between doing a, um, an inoculation. The trichoderma not only fights disease, but actually helps stimulate growth as well as beneficial bacteria. And again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, this is just some pots that were treated with the trichoderma, and you can see the difference in the root growth as opposed to stunted root growth on the left. Um, this was a, a study done by the CNLA, the Connecticut Nursery and Landscape Association. This is going a few years back. Um, so these are old cell phone pictures, so I apologize for the blurriness. But um, basically what they did is they did an overseeding experiment. And um, some of the places were treated with Roundup to initially knock out the lawn and they put seed back in. And you can see the difference where beneficial bacteria were added versus just adding a little fertilizer and seed. Um, you can see it in a couple different spots here, everywhere they did it. Um, and the president at the time, again, was Steve Bousquet. Um, there was a difference in growth in just 10 days. Um, he estimated about 50% better development with the biologicals two to three weeks ahead um, and better recovery from herbicides, um, whether it's organic or synthetic herbicides because those bacteria are breaking them down quicker. Um, this is a great experiment um, in in Pennsylvania, um, a corn grower did this experiment. Um, we got him to, to um, excuse me, to, to go um, lower on his, his fertilizer and he did his best practice, which was three gallons of 10, 10, 10, and I don't know how many pounds per acre that comes out to. Um, and then he did a half rate of beneficials with reduced fertilizer. And then here on the right, he did um, a full rate of beneficials um, 33, actually 77% 70, 77 less fertilizer. Um, and look at the difference in growth. So not only did he reduce fertilizer, which is better, but he got better growth. And that's because, again, those microbes are helping stimulate root growth and other things. And again, um, this is Dewar Roses. Um, they make the, the famous um, knockout roses that a lot of you may use. Um, this calculation in the right, the difference in root growth with roses, um, and again, pine seedlings. So across the spectrum, it's really amazing. And the picture I showed you before of the turf, um, these are the core samples from the turf. Um, um, the, it was estimated he got about three times the difference in root growth. And not only that, but um, I was told the, told the core aerator went right, or the core sampler went right through very easily, very soft. It, it's really amazing what you see. Um, transplant survival, um, again, pictures worth a thousand words. Um, these trees were dipped with beneficial microbes before they were outplanted from a greenhouse to a field. This is two years later. They were never given beneficial microbes again. They were just used best practice. And you can see the difference not only on the right in the transplant survival, um, but the growth difference. It's amazing. Just getting that initial healthy inoculation can make all the difference in the world. And again, orchids on the right with beneficials without. Um, we cut their losses um, down probably in half, which is, is, is a big cost difference for them. And again, this will be all online. This is just a slide. I'm not going to go into the details, but that show a bunch of the different microbes 
um, that are available commercially uh, without talking about specific products. Um, but there's there's a whole host of inoculants out there that are great and wonderful things. So this gets into the, the meat and potatoes of the talk, um, disease and pest control. And um, the title of the talk is The Enemy of My Enemy is My Friend. Um, this, is an old, um, this is an old proverb from, from ancient times. I believe it was a Chinese proverb. Um, it, more recently, we think about it a lot in war times. I know um, Churchill has used similar things. And as much in World War II as we didn't necessarily like Russia. Um, we had a common enemy in Germany and we all got along to, to fight a common enemy. And what you're doing with biologicals is the same thing. You're really exploiting beneficials which are found naturally in the soil and their propensity to fight disease and pests. Um, you're exploiting these and increasing the numbers and giving them a chance to live. Um, again, pesticide laws here in Connecticut, I know a lot of the states in the Northeast and across the country have pesticide bans. Um, in Connecticut, pesticides can't be used K through eight schools, um, public parks. Um, New York has similar type um, um, bans, and this is only going to get worse as we go along. So, what do you do when these these tools are taken out of your 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 belt? And this goes for organic and not. Um, here in Connecticut. Um, um, it's very rare I use the word um, government and sensible legislation, but um, Connecticut actually exempted from the pesticide ban biologicals because they're so safe. Um, and then um, there's also 25B pesticides that are out there, which are basically exempted from pesticide registrations. And a lot of states allow you to use 25B pesticides. The problem with the 25Bs um, is they don't have the stringency as far as testing for efficacy and testing for safety. So um, buyer beware, there's a lot of good products out there, but there's a lot of other ones. But in Connecticut, biologicals can actually be used where pesticide bans are, and I've, I've heard other states are considering this as well. Um, so let's get into first disease control, um, using probiotics for diseases. Um, diagnostics, when you're, when you're doing things organically, and especially with biological, Diagnosis is the key, and I can't stress this enough. Um, and here's why. When you look at the advantages of biologicals, as I mentioned before, these products are silver bullets for so specific pests, and this is the biggest advantage. You can fight a certain pest and wipe it out completely and have no effect on pollinators, bees, butterflies, other beneficials, ladybugs even. Um, and you have almost no off-target effects. You don't have to worry about human safeties. What's the disadvantages? Well, the, dis the biggest disadvantage is the same as the advantage, is these products are silver bullets for specific pests. So if you try to use a certain biological against the wrong pest, you're going to have zero efficacy. You're not going to have off target, but you're not going to kill this, the pest. So really having the diagnosis is key to determine which products to use. And we've got a bunch of different products, and then not we um, as a company, I mean, we as a society have a bunch of different products out there, and they're specific for certain hosts. Um, I don't know, I always like to promote this if you're aware, um, but those with an iPhone, and I think it's on Android and a couple other phones now, um, there's a great app. You download this for free. This is just a snapshot from the Apple iStore. Plant sample submission. Um, I think it's plant sample submission diagnosis, but you'll see that little leaf. And if you download this, um, you get you can basically do the pathology right from your phone. Um, and this is just a little bit more information. And it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, there's a bunch of different universities that are involved, depends on where you are in the country. Here in Connecticut, we have the University of Connecticut. So I go out, customer says, oh, I've got this or I've got that. I basically take my phone, I answer a couple quick questions, I take a picture, I hit send, it goes to Joan Allen at UConn, and Joan, I can't say enough great things about her, she's like a plant whisperer, she gets this, and sometimes within an hour I get a diagnosis back, and I can't tell you how many times I was wrong, I'm not a pathologist, um, where the customers were wrong. Um, not only about the pest, but a lot of times we were able to eliminate the use of pesticides altogether because it was a watering issue or it was a light issue. So I highly suggest downloading this free app and using it whenever available. It's free. The diagnosis is free. Um, and, and you get like a, a pathologist because the diagnosis is the key for um, biological. So I can't stress that enough. Um, so there's three different mechanisms as far as disease. Um, microbes will directly target pathogens. 
um, they produce compounds that kill pathogens. This is how penicillin was discovered. A lot of our drugs, because beneficial microbes um, are fighting a, a biological war. So things like bacillus strains, um, fighting pythophora, for example. But we're basically exploiting these beneficials to produce compounds to directly target mar mar uh, pathogens. Um, Again, the trichoderm I talked about for, for growth. Um, Root Shield's a wonderful product. You can get it a lot of different places. Um, I highly suggest it for multiple reasons, but you can protect roots for 10 to 12 days from soil-borne diseases, um, especially under wet conditions when you'd see things like Phytophthora, um, Rhizoctonia. Um, grows on the roots of all plants. There's no reentry restrictions. I'm relisted. You don't have to worry about the safety of your employees or yourself. Um, grows in all types of media. Grows in a wide pH range and temperature range. Um, compatible with other chemicals if you need them. Um, and basically, it's um, going to grow up. It's going to produce compounds that protect the plant roots. Um, it helps stimulate root growth um, and can be used with just about anything without worries. And again, this is a really neat video showing a trichoderma actually attacking a pathogen. If a picture is worth a thousand words, well, a, the video is worth a million. So um, this is pretty neat stuff. And not just a pathogenic fungi, but also um, a nematode here you'll see. Pretty neat stuff. I'm going to cut that short, but it's it's really amazing. Um, the second is something called Gauss's Law, the Competitive Exclusion Principle. Basically, what it says is um, if you have more numbers of beneficial, pathogens simply can't survive, and this is what you're exploiting. Um, if you look at Homer Simpson here, he's outnumbered by a swarm of bee. One bee alone, you might get stung once. Um, Homer, as you guys know, is not the brightest person. Um, he's going to be outnumbered by the bees, get stung multiple times. He's not going to be happy. That's essentially what you're doing with inoculations. You're outnumbering the good guys with the bad guys, um, as we showed in the video. And the more good guys you have, the less likely it is that you're going to get a pathogenic um, um, thing. Um, the third mechanism is something called trophobiosis, um, which is really neat. And this gets back to the initial part of the talk where we're talking about building healthier plants, less, less pushing with nitrogen. Um, this basically says that pathogens evolved eating dead or weakened plants um, with simple amino acids and sugars. So when you push a plant with nitrogen and it can't make proteins from amino acids and it can't make starches and more complex sugars, a pl an, an insect pest look at that as something in the decay phase, not the growth phase. And that's why nitrogen and, and pushing with hormones and things like that, that type of growth, that's why they're more prone to pests. Um, healthier plants, just like people, somebody that eats healthy exercises versus somebody that doesn't, you put both of those people in a room full of people with the flu, the, the person that's healthier is less likely to get the flu. It's really neat stuff. And I, I don't wanna go, um, I discussed this with Penny, we don't wanna turn this into a um, um, an infomercial. I don't sell all these products, but I do wanna put them out here because when I do generic talks, the number one complaint I get is that we talk about products or we don't talk about specific products. So I put this here just to give you an example of some of the products out there. Um, mentioned Root Shield, C, Sactinivate. I don't know if Sactinivate's still around, um, but Serenates and I, there's a lot of great products out there, biologicals that you can use for disease control. Um, I'm gonna hurry along here because um, we got about five or 10 more minutes. Um, and leave time for questions. Um, so that's the disease section. I'm going to go now into the pest insect section, which is really neat, and end with grubs, which is just amazing changes in the field. Um, so again, this is just a couple examples of um, some of the specific products that are on the market now. And again, um, great changes, a product called Grandivo, which is a beneficial bacterial strain. Um, will take care of many sucking and chewing pests. Um, um, mites, thrips, um, 
no effect against pollinators. Um, the BTs I'm going to I'm going to talk about in more detail. I'm a huge fan of BT products um, because they're very specific for pests, zero off target. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there's things like Bovaria bassiana, um, products called Mycotrol and Botanigard. And again, some of these I sell as a company, some of them don't. I just want to make you guys aware of them. Um, they control a bunch of different insects. Um, Bovaria bassiana we use with caution because it can have some bee toxicity. Um, so we try to use that as and some of the um, organic um, chemistries um, with um, with caution. And then there's beneficial nematodes, which a lot of you may be familiar with. Um, beneficial nematodes, um, I'm going to talk about, it can be very effective. Um, they're very safe, specific for pests, no effect against pollinators. Um, when there's a new host present, nematode population, the natural population will slowly decrease. That's why we supplement with beneficials is we're trying to put the, the um, more beneficials in the soil to catch up with, with the pests growing very quickly. Um, nematodes can be a logistical nightmare. That, that's the issue with them. They're very UV sensitive. Um, you can't apply them in direct sunlight. You usually have to use them within a week. Um, they need to be refrigerated. Um, so they're great. Um, they're very dependent on soil temperatures if you're outside. They need a host to divide. So um, knowing your host's life cycle is very critical because if there's not a host there for the nematodes, they just die. Um, and then once they kill the host, they die off. So you're constantly replenishing. Um, they're very good in controlled environments. Um, people with greenhouses use them um, less so with turf and outside, but they can be effective when used correctly with the right um, watering. Um, this is just exciting developments. Um, this was um, the chromobacterium, again, a beneficial bacteria that's been studied recently. Um, a wide effect against um, a bunch of different pests, um, from mites to thrips, um, boars um, for the tree people and the arborists out there. Um, and it's the best biological I know of. Um, there's just new research coming out on the spotted wing Drosophila. And if you look at this product, the biological versus chemicals, um, this is where I like to say biologicals and organics is no longer a compromise. Not only are they working as well as the chemistries, um, the synthetic chemistries, but in a lot of cases better. And here with a lot of the chemistries, you will have off target effects and you don't get that with certain products like the chromobacterium, just amazing advances in the field, um, amazing things. Um, the BT species, um, a big fan of, I know in recent years, um, the BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, um, has gotten a bad rap a little bit because um, some of the um, technology companies have come out with um, genetically engineered or genetically modified um, plants that have BT built into it. And that's, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the natural BT bacteria species. Um, that are found naturally in the soil. They're not genetically engineered or modified. You're not producing a ton in a plant and inducing resistance. Um, the great thing about the BTs are the specificities. And again, this is where the diagnosis is key. Um, for the Lepidoptera or the caterpillars, um, I, usually when I'm in front of an audience, I would ask for hands, but how many people have seen the gypsy moths, especially here in the Northeast the last two years, they've decimated trees. Um, BT, there's two different species, the Kirstaki and the Aizawai, um, excuse my pronunciation, I don't even know if that's commercially available, but the BTK as it's called is readily commercially available, very cheap, and it will go after the caterpillar stage of um, gypsy moths and, and other pathogens. Just be careful, um, you don't want to treat, um, they do have to ingest it, so you can treat a tree where you have gypsy moths. Um, or the eggs, you have to get them in the um, larval stage. Um, but we'll be very specific, but you do want to be careful around beneficial uh, caterpillars that will true. And um, the true flies, um, there's a BT Israeliensis species, um, or BTI is it called. And again, the BTI will not have any effect against Lepidoptera or caterpillars and vice versa. Um, but we use the BT, how many of you had had a left something out, your kids leave a toy out, and you look in and you see this um, in a bird bath, for example, you see all these mosquito larvae. Um, you can put this BTI in the, in the sitting water um, and it'll kill the larvae of, of mosquitoes. 
Um, we use it, we just last week, um, we were working with a big aquaponics grower in Meriden and they had um, fungus gnats. They use the BTI um, because it's aquaponics. They, they have a double whammy. They're trying to do it organically. They have fish that are used as food as well as the plants. So they want to go organic, but they have to. And we gave them BTI. I got a text back 24 hours later that they saw all the, all the um, um, fungus gnat larvae floating on the top of the water, and it was very safe for the fish. And then I'm going to talk about BTG, which is, I think, the most amazing thing in the organic world. Um, we'll talk about that for grubs. Um, how do the BTs work? Um, like I said, the insect has to ingest what are called the cry proteins that the BTs make. Um, they solubilize um, the toxins, the cry toxins. Um, they, they bind a receptor in the stomach of the insect. And this is where the specificity comes from because certain um, certain pest insects um, will have certain receptors for for specific cry proteins that are made by the different BTs. And that's where the specificity comes by, depends on these receptors in the stomach. Um, once bound, these, these um, bacterial produce proteins poke holes in the stomach, um, disrupting their gut. Uh, the insects stop feeding, they go septic, and they die. And again, silver bullets, um, very quick, very non-toxic, very easy, and bye-bye pest. Um, the other thing I love about the BTs, this is from the Xerces Society that does wonderful things for pollinators. Um, as you see, the BTs um, have the best non-toxic rating. And again, we were talking about the Bovaria, highly toxic. And, and you'll see here, um, as I said, organic doesn't even mean, doesn't always mean safe. Things like diatomaceous earth, which can be wonderful, can be toxic to pollinators and beneficial. So again, this is where biologicals are, are filling a key niche is they're so specific and so safe for pollinators that um, um, even things like neem oils, um, pyrethrins can be organic. Um, this is where biologicals, I think, are going to be not only now are coming into their own a huge thing, but in the future, this is where the field is really going. So um, just absolutely wonderful. Um, BTs are great um, and a lot of the other compounds coming out. Um, so the last section, um, I'm going to go through this. I got about five more minutes here and we'll do questions. Um, beetle and grub control, because again, as I said, um, beetle, I think grub control was really a holy grail for organic applicators. Um, we're going to talk about three different things, milky spore nematodes, and now the new BTG that's come out, again, the BT species for grubs. Um, as I mentioned before, nematodes are great, but especially for landscapers or turf care professionals, it's a logistical nightmare. People have to go out at night and apply them. Um, you need your, your customers to irrigate. Um, they will work under the right conditions, but they're very expensive and just logistically difficult to apply. So a lot of people just don't like applying nematodes, especially in turf situations. Milky spore, um, milky spore used to be the best um, for grubs. Um, when I bought my house 10 years ago, first thing we did was put milky spore down. Um, if you Google milky spore in Yukon, milky spore in UMass, milky spore in um, Rutgers, um, they'll basically tell you now milky spore doesn't work. It's very inconsistent, especially in the northeastern part of the country. Um, there seems to be resistance. Um, it doesn't seem to overwinter like it's supposed to. And the biggest drawback is that milky spore, which is a bacterium, um, is um, specific for only the Japanese beetles. And um, for whatever reason, um, in this part of the country, a lot of part of the countries, the populations have shifted. And Japanese beetles, believe it or not, are no longer the, the biggest um, grub pest um, and beetle pest. It's European chafers, um, Asiatic, Oriental. So uh, milky spore had a very limited um, range when it worked. Um, so a lot of people are getting away from milky spore. Um, the newest thing, and I think the biggest advance in the field, is, again, a Bacillus thuringiensis. This is Bacillus BT Galleria, um, new product that came out on the market about three years ago. They had some production issues, but people that used it um, and the university professors um, that tested it, for example, here in Connecticut, Dr. Rich Coles um, and UMass, Dr. Vidum tested this. Um, Absolutely wonderful results. As I said, compared to milky spore, which is also a bacterium, um, they both work against Japanese beetles, but when you look at all the other grubs and chafers, uh, BT is a very broad spectrum. Um, they're actually testing it on um, borers right now as well, um, although it's not labeled yet. 
and um, it's a wettable powder as well as a granular. Um, there's no restrictions. Um, effective in the Northeast, where milky spores is, is um, um, questionable, um, you can do one application a season um, and works preventatively, works curatively. Um, amazing product and an indefinite shelf life. Um, this is the biggest change I've seen. Um, really a silver bullet for grubs, very effective. Um, a lot of landscapers will put it out in August when they don't have other things to do. But as the landscapers out there know, there's two types of customers, those that will pay ahead of time for grub control and those that are gonna call you in September and October when their grass is blowing away. Um, this you can use in both cases, which is great. Um, as I said, this is um, data from Dr. Vidim. And again, organics is no longer a compromise. Um, this is a golf course study on grubs. Um, you see the untreated, obviously, um, no suppression of grubs. With um, the BTGs, you got almost 90% um, suppression, which is more than enough. Um, and when you look at the imidacloprids and some of the um, synthetics that it was compared to, you actually had better efficacy with zero toxicity against people or um, um, beneficials. Um, again, this was a study by Dan Gilrine at Cornell um, looking at third instar grubs, which again is another holy grail because even with a lot of the synthetics, you have to get them at first, second instar. You have to get them ahead of time prophylactically. Um, the um, BTGs worked against the third instar as well. So it gives you a lot more flexibility, um, does need to be watered in the BTGs, just like any other grub control, synthetic or not. Uh, but once it's watered in the soil, it'll sit there for up to three months um, before the beetles come, unlike nematodes and um, broader spectrum than than um, beetle uh, than uh, excuse me uh, milky spore. And again, um, with the beetles, this will also work against uh, adult beetles. Um, this is just looking at skeletonized or, or essentially killed beetles. And um, you can see in here with the controls that the BTGs worked as well as metacloprid and a perm um, permethrin, so um, better with no toxicity. So just really amazing stuff. Um, this is the thing I'm most excited about in the field of organics. So in summary, um, so I'm going to just finish up here just so you know ahead of time, Penny. Um, a huge increase from your customers to go greener. People want to go greener. Um, most um, customers, and again, this is an old slide from 2000 to 2008, there was a 240% increase. I'm sure that's a lot more. Um, so beneficial microbes will help you increase germination, root growth, yields, quality, um, decreased disease and pest pressure, a natural tool to help you reduce fertilizer use and costs and comply with um, fertilizer bans, um, an effective alternative when pesticides are undesirable or banned, um, cost effective part of any treatment. Um, even though we only sell organics, I would say 90% of my customers aren't organic. Um, they're just using these products because they're finding they work better and because they're forced to and they're happy they were forced to. Simply, you'll be able to provide better quality service and products with higher yields at higher costs. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry I went through this quickly. Um, and I think, Penny, we can open it up for questions now. I'm sure there's plenty. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. Where do you see the future of biologicals going since it's changing so quickly? I think that what you're going to see, and um, in this field, I, I relate it a lot to probably um, a salesman trying to sell a, a personal computer back in the 80s. And people would come, why do I need this expensive calculator in my home? And right now, I think we have six computers in my house for three people. Um, so when you think about from then to now, any any technology field, there's, um, there's a technology um, where these products come out and they're initially expensive, but I'm starting to see um, not just biologicals, but organic products coming down in costs. Um, like the BTGs for grub control right now is going to be more expensive than in Celeprin, but cheaper than um, nematodes. But that price is coming down in the next couple of years as production comes up. And like any technology, the cost comes up. So I think these products are not only going to become cheaper and more accessible to everybody, 
but I think they're going to become the norm. And I think you're just going to see a lot of the chemistries, the synthetic chemistries, or organic chemistries just start to fade away because these are going to be just as cheap and um, just as powerful. And um, every year we're seeing new products come out that are specific for pests, um, new research coming out showing biologicals working against more and more pests and diseases. And I think this is really going to become the norm in the field um, for organic or not. Okay. Is there any progress on with the biological controls for any of the new tree threats? Um, the I did mention the BTG right now. They're doing studies. Um, the the company that produces that is doing studies with the U.S. Forestry on the Emerald Dash Borer, and they're finding efficacy, although it's not labeled for that. Um, I know there are biologicals that are being used for um, some of the other tree pests that are coming out fairly rapidly. Um, the, the spotted wing drosophila, um, for example, I mentioned that before. Um, that's a huge problem. And that's the first one where I think organic growers are actually at a disadvantage because um, the spotted wing drosophila goes after healthy fruit, um, where a lot of pathogens, other pathogens go after um, decaying fruit or rotting fruit. Um, where the, the spotted wing actually goes after fruit with more sugars and um, organic growers tend to have higher bricks levels or sugars. So um, biologicals are coming along for um, um, spotted wing drosophila, which is a big problem for orchard growers. So I do see this coming out. Um, I think, you know, um, in fairness, biologicals are at a bit of a disadvantage, especially in trees, because these pests come on very rapidly. And, and like we've seen with um, the um, gypsy moths or the spotted wing drosophila, damage can happen very quickly. And um, there are some growers who don't want to use synthetics, but synthetics sometimes are their only choice or even organic um, organic compounds that can be still toxic to beneficials. Um, but they do it with timing, for example, apply at night when pollinators won't be out or apply when things aren't in bloom and they can be safely used in some cases. Um, but biologicals are still generally tend to be better prophylactically and slower acting than synthetics. So um, I think there is a disadvantage, but I have seen some research come out for things like spotted wing, gypsy moths. Um, uh, and like I said, the emerald ash borer, there's progress going on with biologicals for that. And that would really be game changers. Okay. The last question that we have deals with uh, the weed control side. Can you go into a little bit about that and how biologicals are being used? Sure. Um, I didn't mention this um, just because of the scope and the timing of the talk, but this is something in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of this is probably more for the, the turf people out there, um, but um, a lot of people that have grown organically or, or done organic turf care, excuse me, um, have always noticed um, less weeds. And especially as you get about a year into an organic product program, you're going to see um, better weed control. And right now, there are products coming onto the market um, for organic weed control, um, especially selective weed control. But um, their efficacy is still um, nowhere near where you get with synthetic weed control. One thing that came out that was really interesting, um, the word always was with organic um, turf care was the weed control happened because you were shading out the weeds. And um, they might be able to pull up a slide here but um, as I'm talking. But um, um, I, never, I never really believed that too much because um, um, I, I've got some pictures, and let me see if I can pull it up real quick, where I actually see the weeds um, shading out the, um, here we go. Here's some pictures, if you can see my screen, of weeds shading out um, uh, the grass, not the other way around. So we know high mowing, you get less weed pressure, as this picture shows. Um, but I, I really don't see the grass shading out these dandelions here. Um, what was really cool is a couple of years ago, paper started coming out. Um, a lot of people know some of the weeds, like crabgrass, for example, is allopathic. In other words, it put compounds out into the soil that will kill um, the turf that you want so that when the crabgrass dies in the fall, you've got a lot of um, just empty um, turf in which weeds tend to keep control. Um, what they found is um, it's actually these allopathic chemicals are killing the soil microbial communities. Uh, really neat stuff. 
Um, and here's a couple of papers that are showing this. Um, so basically crabgrass and other weeds are putting out compounds that kill the biology. When the biology dies, um, you actually are getting um, um, less healthy soil and weeds tend to thrive in less healthy soil. And this seems to be the mechanism. Now this is still very early, but um, I think this makes more sense to me that why organic growers who are doing a lot of soil inoculations or practices that maintain the soil bacteria and fungi um, see less weed pressure. I don't think it's the shading out as much as it is the, the beneficial microbes are overcoming this allopathy that, that's being caused. And it's, it's a really neat concept. So this is another area, again, where biologicals, the, the, the um, science is really catching up and, and really just showing um, really neat things um, in the field. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this information, Joe. It's definitely given us a lot to think about. And thank you all for attending the presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, this information, as a follow-up, you'll be receiving a brief webinar survey. Please take a few moments to provide feedback on this program and also give us uh, any topics for future webinars that you'd be interested in. Thank you again, Joe. We appreciate your time and all of this information. Thank to you, Penny, and everybody out there. And, and feel free to give me a call or email me with that information there and be happy to answer any questions offline. Thanks again. Have a good day. Bye, everybody.